All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Ones and Twos Live. <laughs> My name's Claudia. I am the social media manager for the podcast. If you follow our Twitter, you might see my tweets. If you don't, you definitely should. Uh, thank you all so much for being here tonight. This is the first time we've ever done a live recording, a live event for Ones and Twos. We're so happy to see all your faces, see it sell out. Our production staff has the pleasure of hearing Adam and Cam's unedited conversations every week when we record. So this is our chance to share a little bit of that with you. We're coming up, um, we just passed our one year anniversary for Ones and Twos. It's been a year since we started, thank you. Before it was Ones and Twos, we had a whole slew of names to choose from. Twosie and Economics, Twos You Can Use, Twos Sayer, but eventually we settled on the beloved Ones and Twos. Tonight's event will eventually be an episode down the line, so look for that eventually. But we want you all to be as much of a part of it as Adam and Cam, so feel free to cheer, laugh, clap like you've been doing. We really appreciate it. And yeah, we are a production of Foreign Policy Magazine. I know that we have a couple foreign policy staffers here. Yes, yes, our CEO, Andrew Sullinger, is in the crowd. Woo. Awesome. But really, we would not be able to make the show without the support of our FP subscribers. If you're already a foreign policy subscriber, thank you. And if you're not, we'd like to offer you a bit of a discount tonight. So you can go to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe, and you can use the code twos. T-O-O-Z-E, to get 15% off your first year or your first month. Definitely should. I think that's everything that should cover it. I think it's time to hear about some data points that explain the world. So without further ado, let's hear it for our Ones and Twos co-hosts, Cameron Abadi and Adam Twos. <laughs> Looks like a packed house. Um, all right. Uh, hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. I'm Cameron Abadi. <laughs> this is Adam Twos. Uh, I'm pleased to say we are both in New York. Uh, <laughs> I will admit, until uh, we saw each other backstage, I was. I thought there was a small chance uh, that Adam was going to be calling in from somewhere else in the world. I wasn't, wasn't quite sure. Usually when I call in every week when we, when we do our podcast recordings, I literally don't know sometimes where he is. So I thought there was a chance I would be up here and Adam would be in New Zealand or Tanzania or somewhere else. But no, we are both in New York uh, and happy to be here. Uh, as you heard, we've been doing this for about a year. Uh, I should say... Actually, we've been releasing them for about a year. I don't, I don't know if you remember, Adam. We made a few practice podcasts. Um, no one else has heard those, and there's a reason. They were not very good. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, or I was not very good. Let's, let's put it that way. I don't want to put this on Adam. Uh, uh, it was a bit more meandering, uh, uh, not quite as focused. Um, but uh, we have our format now, and uh, we're going to stick to it tonight. Uh, um, we're going to try to fit in f three full segments, um, plus also hopefully have some time for a couple of listener questions or audience questions as it is, and, uh, uh, and then ending with something I'm thinking of as a lightning round, basically a, a couple of rapid fire questions uh, uh, for Adam, uh, and we'll do that at the very end. Um, so we don't have our expert crew of editors with us uh, to edit us down tonight, so we will uh, try to keep it concise and uh, see what we can do. So, the first data point for tonight is two, and that is uh, as in twos. I'm sorry, that's a, a, a very <laughs> terrible joke, but, um, uh, but in reality, yes, the first segment uh, is about Adam himself. Uh, I, I get a lot of questions about the name of the podcast. I also get a lot of questions uh, about Adam, so we thought we'd try to unpack you. Uh, 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 and treat you as one of the subjects we otherwise treat in our podcast, uh, at least a little bit here. So, 
Adam, one thing I always have to tell people is that you're not an economist. Uh, you are a historian, in fact, um, uh, an economic historian. So yeah, tell us, when, when exactly did you settle on economics as a focus for your work uh, a, as a historian? I mean, were you considering specializing in other fields of history, or was it the other way around? Did economics lead you to history to begin with? Um, so, uh, I mean, for me, it goes back to early childhood, and I don't think anyone really starts out as an early child economist. Hmm. Um, but I think quite a lot of kids have a kind of early childhood passion for history, and I was one of those. I think the earliest, the first book I ever asked for was a ladybird history of William the Conqueror, 1066. That it's was a, the first book to clarify, yeah. not a hop on pop. Not no, a no, no, that was the first book I actually wanted. Was I see. This, uh, it's, uh, if you see these, they're from the 60s. They have absolutely fantastic illustrations. And, mm. uh, so that, I, that just grabbed me. And um, so I was like a kind of precocious little um, military history brat, basically. Okay. Uh, it was kind of ghoulish, awful, really, in retrospect. But I was totally obsessed with military history. And I think I only ended up in economics kind of almost as a way of civilizing that. Because I, um, I got really into very complicated um, war games. Like these things with you know boards and complicated rules and and um, uh, probabilistic decision rules mm. and um, economics seemed like a civilized way out of that obsession. Like it seemed like a way of kind of taming that that mm. that combination of, of formalism and history. And uh, so I ended up I ended up studying. I mean economics. Per force, because in Britain you can't do both things at once. In the UK you can't do history and economics. So mm. I was forced to choose. I was I was particularly obsessed with macroeconomic models in my teens, and so that's kind of what selected me to mm. do economics. And I've slid back into history then through alienation from economics mm. in in my early twenties. Really, I mean, um, there's lots of different reasons one can become alienated from economics, but I did, and so ended up back in history. And that, so the com that they've always gone hand in hand for me, but but in the end, in terms of a professional home, history is far more congenial than economics would ever have been. And I kind of drifted a long way from economics in some of my historical writing, never completely absent, but really quite a long way away from it. And it was really with Crashed, mm. writing about the 2008 crisis, that it all came roaring back, because that really is a book organized around a set of ideas in economics, first and foremost. My first book, similarly, was a history of e macroeconomics. And really, for me, the fascination of 2008 is that it breaks the macroeconomic paradigm, right? 2008 is the moment when we realize that this huge event in global e economic history cannot really be grasped in terms of the Keynesian macroeconomic aggregates. It can't be grasped in terms of conventional current account deficits, the twin deficit model, so the fact that the US had both a government deficit and they trade deficit didn't explain. Many people thought it would explain, but it didn't explain what happened. And so 2008 is interesting because it forces us, as it were, to actually reevaluate the conceptual frameworks that we're using. And you can't write that history without actually going re-engaging with the economics, and that was the moment when I did. Mm. And so this new, this phase, this latest phase of my career, my intellectual development is a kind of somewhat surprising and a kind of mid midlife Re, you know, effort to synthesize those two things, bring them back into a kind of uh, a conversation. Yeah, I'm gonna <coughs> take down the name of that book you mentioned, your first book you you read. Maybe I'll get that for my kid. But after we finish <laughs> the Hobbit, maybe I'll fit in the, the whatever you you were referring to there. But um, uh, 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 but I want to rewind to your education again a little bit because yeah, you studied in in Britain at Cambridge at the London School of Economics, and uh, yeah, this got me wondering what is the difference between getting an education in Britain versus the United States. I mean, I know one thing I know about your writing as your editor at Foreign Policy. I mean, we've talked about all sorts of subjects for pieces uh, uh, and, and, and for the podcast as well. The, the, the state of the bond markets to, you know, uh, uh, the social theory of Ulrich Beck. Um, we've talked about, uh, um, you know, sovereign debt and we've talked about, um, you know, we just did a long recording about Bruno Latour, this French postmodern philosopher. And, and so I think that's one of the remarkable things I think most people would recognize about your approach, your analytical approach, is that you're kind of conversing in all these different 
um, different, different, different uh, perspectives and, and the connections between them. And I don't know, my feeling is that academia in the US is more specialized. That was more of my experience. And so yeah, is this sort of wide ranging synthesizing approach characteristic of education in Britain or is this, is this just an Adam Tooze thing? I mean, I would, I would see it the other way around, really. I mean, I, I, mean, I said this in that New York uh, magazine profile, but you know, I liken the sort of training that I was given and the sort of training that I delivered at Cambridge to, in the best sense of the word, like an artisanal European tradition. Like it, it actually feels like you're part of a guild when you're in Cambridge. And what you're basically teaching people to do is make sausage absolutely the right way to whatever standard we locally have defined is the way that sausage will be made. Sausage here being? Essays, okay. historical, <laughs> his, history essays. Okay. And there is a extraordinarily dense, highly sophisticated sense of what a good historical essay is that you are conveying, that you yourself were inculcated into, that everyone around the table at the examiner's meeting, and you have to understand that in Cambridge, exams for all three years of the tripos are examined by the entire body of the teaching group. So there's 130 people who teach history at Cambridge at any one moment, 130 people. Mm. So it's twice the size of the largest American department. And th all of them are mobilized in three large groups to double blind mark all of the essays of all of the students. So it's like a giant blind wine tasting. <laughs> of students. This is why I use this artisanal analogy, because that's what you do. You sit around. The moment I arrived, we just introduced numerical marking, because previously they'd had an alphanumerical system which allowed them to say things like, I really like the attack of this essay, but the body's a little bit thin, and the finish really just kind of leaves me feeling flat. <laughs> okay. And you could say this, and literally no one was huh. joking. This is how they would describe student essays. And so that is what we were training people to do, is to write essays which had powerful attack, big full body, you know, a conclusive finish. And then you would, ideally, you'd have a student who can make a whole bouquet of different essays mm. across five or six exam papers, three essays per paper, 15 different essays. And what you would want is a student who could really modulate across that range of, mm. of essay writing types. Now, obviously, that kind of training does not happen in any American college. Full stop, right? American colleges, to my mind, are much more like food courts, where basically the professors are like hawking, or like, you know, a Singapore hawker's market. Everyone is out there hustling their thing, dumplings over here, noodles over there, kebab there, like, don't know the other <laughs> corner, burgers there. And, you know, the students kind of meander around, and like in the, in the, in the student, you know, in the student cafeterias in the US, they like slop it all on their plates. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's no alcohol, obviously, unlike in Cambridge, but like, yeah. the, the, that's kind of the, the basic model. And, and the sexier you're offering, the more interesting, you know, whatever fusion style it is you're offering right now, you know, the, you know porn in the morn, what the psychology of sex, the Yale course, or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever happens to be going is, and people compete, you know, they want big audiences, they, they, they live for student feedback. Like, no one in Cambridge gave a damn. Mm. Why? It, was, it wasn't the student's choice. No one gave a, a shit about what the students thought, right? Because what you're doing is teaching people how to make sausage, mm. right? And that's, and in it, so there was this incredible self-confidence to it. But none of these things really answers your question. Like, that isn't where this comes from. Like, that, those are, like, they're, neither of those answer this. The, the, the answer to your question is Germany, 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 right? I mm. mean, the, 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 the mode of, like, intellectualism the, the, uh, has shaped my life, and I'm not at all exceptional in this, it's just a style, right? Mm. Is a kind of continental intellectual style uh, for which basically the anchor since the 19th century is Marxism, right? And the mode of, the, so, you know, the, 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 you know this, this, the formula of British economics, French politics, and German philosophy mm. is, you know, is, this, is the trite formula for making Marxists. And that's basically, though that's not my politics, that's basically the frame within which I understand comprehensive intellectual engagement with modernity. It requires those three elements. Mm. You need to have a sophisticated political grip. You need to have a philosophy of history, which in the German sense, of course, comes from Hegel. And, and you have to understand capitalism, otherwise you're stuck. Mm. And so that's, that's, as it were, the frame that's, that I've always felt we have to continuously navigate and bounce around between. Um, so that's, and I, you know, yeah, I, was, I, was, I grew up in Germany in the 70s and 80s, and you know, I was, grew up in Heidelberg, which is an intellectual academic town, and would browse the bookstores. 
and that that was the shape. You know, Surkamp basically mm. was like my lodestar. Um, but then Nerva and all of the other you know funkier German publishing houses. But that that kind of mode is is uh, is what is what uh, I didn't even aspire to it. It's just like it's just the it's just the atmosphere that you Im imbibe and, and live within, and nothing else makes sense to me at some level. There you go. Okay, Marx is the key. Marx is the key well, to unlock. Not, not in a, I mean, yeah, I, no. you know, I'm, but in just as a, that's de facto the frame of this kind of of this kind of grasp of modernity. So these days, as you uh, as I mentioned, you're uh, uh, often flying around the world. You're talking to different groups, uh, talking to different governments, talking to different uh, uh, private firms, uh, uh, advising them uh, on on how to think about the world. Um, this got me thinking about this famous quote from Larry Summers, uh, and he had famously told Elizabeth Warren when she first ran for the Senate that, that, that she could be an insider or an outsider. And that outsiders, he said, quote, they can say whatever they want, but people on the inside don't listen to them. Insiders, however, get lots of access and a chance to push their ideas. People, powerful people, listen to what they have to say, but insiders also understand one unbreakable rule. They don't criticize other insiders. So first, Adam, do you think that assessment of Larry Summers is true? And secondly, are you an insider or an outsider? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Summers clearly like, so he sold the same thing to Yanis Varoufakis, right? I mean, <laughs> most, many people yeah. in this room will have encountered that version of Summers through the melodramatic opening of Varoufakis' mm. adults in the room. Like, it's like in whatever, it was a rainy night in DC, it's and he pulled me into a bar, and then I stumbled out, you know, Varoufakis. In case you don't know, that's the former Greek you know, finance minister who famously wore a leather jacket. He was sort of like the, the rebel, rebellious the finance the minister, and he yeah, got a talking yeah, to yeah, also yeah, by, yeah. by Larry Summers. He was um, being too much of an outsider. So, <laughs> you're not getting out of the question. Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, um, well, I'm clearly not an insider in that sense. And I don't aspire to it, and it's never been a never been a desire or a strategy. Um, so that's you know that's simple to, to answer at one level, but it's also not true, right? Because because um, I do have access, and people do in fact listen to you, even if you do criticise. This is like if, if you, Summers is actually genuinely persuaded by that, it's tragic <laughs> because <laughs> it's wrong. Okay, it's not <laughs> true. It's not true that you cannot have access and influence without being critical of other people on mm. the inside. And we know at least one really tragic moment in American history, the early phase of the Obama administration, where it seems as though he did act out that role, right? Where he basically tried to persuade, well, he didn't just try, he succeeded in persuading the Obama transition team that an adequate stimulus would be quote unquote non-planetary. And that if you even put that on the agenda, you would rule yourself out of serious discussion. And one wishes that he really had had the courage of his convictions because he knew perfectly well the stimulus needed to be twice as big. Christy Roman knew that it needed to be twice as big, and he was complicit in the process of whittling down Obama's options, so he ended up with less. So here I am saying this about hmm. Summer's life. So, you know, violating the <laughs> basic norm. And I know perfectly well it will have zero impact yeah. on whether I do or do not talk to Schumer's staff or mm. anyone else that I might have, uh, you know, inter interplay with. It's, just, it's not true. You, you are proof that it is it's, not it's true. Not, it's not <laughs> true at that level, right? Or rather, it's a particularly unpolitical version mm. of insiderdom, which I think is a curse, really, of a certain sort of American elite politics. Mm. Um, so, so no, I don't, I don't believe, I don't believe that that's, that's true. On the other hand, I'm also profoundly uncomfortable with the sort of preening, um, you know, uh, a, a presumption or kind of imagining of certain folks um, who think of themselves as perpetual outsiders, you know, and somehow, and because that's absurd, right? Mm. I mean, if you teach at Cambridge, Yale, and Columbia, you're not on the outside of anything. <laughs> you know, you're, you're absolutely in the pocket of the... I mean, you know, these places are as rich as they are because they have absolutely privileged access to not just Wall Street, but to the most privileged elements of the private finance system. That's why Yale's endowment is as big as it is, right? They pioneered unconventional investment. We should do an episode about it. Mm. It's a very interesting story. And no one can replicate this, the this performance of the Yale portfolio <laughs> because you cannot get access to the super elite tranches of private equity, hedge fund type deals, which Yale can because Yale is a flagship and the funds love to have Yale as part of their package because it allows them to attract other money. Mm. So, and you know, they paid my handsome salary for many years. And, 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 and the same is true to a lesser than less successful extent of Columbia. So mm. you are, whether you like it or not, structurally 
inside the system. Furthermore, in a way that I didn't even experience in England, um, the American uh, you know, elite education system reproduces itself and its depths of contacts and the degree of like inside closure with Washington, with publishing in New York and so on is so intense. I mean, it's to a, to a European, to an English person, for somebody from Cambridge, mm. it's quite staggering how tightly knit it is, right? So the kind of positive, you know, the, the kind of the positioning, the attempt to, as it were, position a, a radical politics from that kind of perch has always struck me, certainly is not something that I have any, mm. any basis for, you know, for claiming or you know, certainly on the basis of identity, obviously not as a white upper middle class male, like the, that, that doesn't wash. So, so yeah, so I, I kind of feel like oh, you're some sort of outside insider or inside mm. outsider. Um, and in some senses, this entire set of distinctions is quite unhelpful. Like, really, what is your politics? I don't talk to Tories. I don't talk to Republicans. There's a whole bunch of things I absolutely just full stop won't do. <laughs> and, yeah. and, um, yeah. and so, no, seriously, like at the level of you do not, you never cross that line, right? It's like a picket line. You just do not go over. There is no basis for a conversation with any kind of public conversation that engages that, that, that kind of politics. So that is the more important dividing line, I think, than this inside-outside you know, category. Maybe it just comes down to your, your fashion. I mean, you just got to get a leather jacket on and uh, like Varoufakis, you'll be definitely an outsider. <laughs> you know, that'll, 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 that'll decide it. But um, I want to ask about this term that you've developed, uh, um, the polycrisis. Um, this is, I, I think, I think a, a term that you've developed yourself for describing our current situation. Basically, multiple overlapping, mutually reinforcing crises going on in the world, operating on different levels from climate change to nuclear, now Armageddon, to sovereign debt crises and global recession. That These crises are all happening and they're all connected and they're all mutually reinforcing somehow. And the question I had in thinking about this is, it was whether this is an, an empirical phenomenon that you're describing, or is this kind of a framework for thinking about the world? I mean, is this, is this really what's going on, or is this, is this a kind of way you want to encourage to look at the world, that basically everything, if you look at it a certain way, is unstable, everything is potentially a kind of crisis, and everything is connected in, in a certain way. That often seems to me the way we're talking about issues, even before this particular poly crisis happened. So is that what you're, go you're after here? I mean, is this a kind of broader analytical kind of framework, how you see the world? So it is, but it's important for me to say that I didn't invent the term uh, or even coin it. Like, um, and that's kind of part of the method because what I'm most interested in, and again, I'm like it's it's a sort of something something I feel highly indebted to the Marxist tradition for, is that the categories that we use to analyze the contemporary reality. Contemporary reality is so complex and so self-reflexive and so continuously productive of categories for its own analysis and for its understanding of itself, that there's something hubristic in coming along and imagining that we can kind of impose a category on that world. And so w what Marx, for instance, did in writing Capital is go inside the machine, go to the factory inspector's reports, engage with classical political economy, hybridize it with other things, and out of that then comes the entire edifice, right, of, of, that, thought, of that thought. So this concept of polycrisis is much more humble than that, it's like, but it's kicking around. You know, and, and it was Jean-Claude Juncker, of all people, you know, the bibulous hmm. former Luxembourg oh, wow. prime okay. minister, commi European uh, uh, Commission president, who started saying, you know, you know, Europe's situation in 14, 15, 16 is overwhelmingly difficult and dangerous. And there's this idea called polycrisis out there. And he got it from this sort of second tier <laughs> French theorist of complexity and environmentalism called Edgar Morin, who's really an interesting link between like the French resistance tradition and existentialism and post-war French philosophy and Jean-Claude Juncker and the current moment and Larry Summers, <laughs> who's now like, a, you know, who's now like it touting the same circle. concept around. Okay. And, um, and so I just like, I figure, you know, a bit like with the 2008 book on macro finance, the really interesting thing is when these kind of ideas, which are quite interesting in their own right, like emerge out of the reality that you're trying to make sense of. And that, that, what is it? What is it? I, mean, I like it in part because it's so open-ended. 
Because uh, one of the things I like, one of the things I'm skeptical of is like overly simplistic social theorizing, which knows in advance what the principal contradiction is going to be. Oh, yeah, we're in late capitalism, duh, obviously. Or, oh, yes, that's clearly an issue of imperialism. Surprise, surprise. Or, you know, so on and so forth, right? That seems to me rather uninteresting as a way of engaging with the world. Because I've, my overwhelming impression, and if you deal with serious people in the real world, their overwhelming impression is not that it's easy to understand what's going on. You speak to people in like running, you know, running serious money in macro hedge funds, they've got no clue what's going on, <laughs> right? And they struggle every day to make sense of it. They do not start with strong priors most of the time. It's dangerous to do that. Mm. So what's interesting for me about the polycrisis kind of model is that it is so open-ended. All it's really saying is we're in a crisis, which means we're facing challenges which challenge our ability to cope and therefore our identity. That's what, to me, a de defines a crisis. Got that from Habermas years in the 70s. What makes this poly is that the source of the crisis is diverse, multiple and diverse. In other words, it's not one big thing, but this sort of hail of different shocks which are impacting on mm. us. And why it's one thing, nevertheless, is that those interact with each other such that the sum is worse than, so that the total is worse than the sum of the parts. And that, that to me, seems to describe our situation. I think... My wager is, and it's no more than that, but my wager analytically is that this is new in its, and Summers agrees, right? And this is why he's picked it up. He's, he says, like, you know, typical Larry Summers style, in my 40 years of taking an interest in these things, this seems to me the most incoherent. Like, I say, like, Larry, okay, I'll give you an extra 10 and tell you about the 1970s, which you may not remember. And even then, yes, by comparison with the last half century, I would argue, ever, we have not seen this kind of weird heterogeneous, diverse range of impacts. This is also where I'm heavily indebted to somebody like Bruno Latour in that he's insisting on the strangeness of the reality that we're in. And A, that, and B, it's cumulating, right? So if you take the climate crisis seriously, if you take the environmental crisis seriously, if you just look at the dem demographics of the world, there's no reason for imagining that our current condition is like any previous period in our species experience, right? The, on the contrary, there's every reason to think that it is increasingly radical and unhinged and unlike any previous moment. We've never managed eight billion people on the planet. We've never had nation states like modern China and modern India operating. And so that's what polycrisis is sort of gesturing towards. And it's the emergence of the concept, to go back to your first question, is to a degree symptomatic of the state we're in. Like when we need a catch-all kind of category like that, mm. and even folks like Jean-Claude Juncker are becoming like tempted to use it, and Summers too, I'd say, yeah, kind of, we're not just in a, you know, it's not just a crisis in itself, it's a crisis for itself. We are, in some senses, actually immersed in a kind of s collective nervous breakdown, like a collective shattering crash test of our categories. And that's, yeah, I do think that, in some ways, captures our, our reality right now. Did not expect you to say you're intellectually indebted to Jean-Claude Juncker, the Sort of, uh, uh, yeah, there we go. There it's we like are. a found yeah. concept. Yeah. Like it's, you know, like the urinal, like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, uh, uh, okay, wait, uh, uh, I'm gonna ask one more question uh, and then we'll move on to our next segment. Uh, 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 the question I most often get about you uh, uh, is, uh, 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 how is Adam II so productive? Uh, uh, in, in fact, in our editorial meetings and at foreign policy, there are theories that go around that, <laughs> Adam twos, uh, there may be clones of Adam twos, that maybe Adam is one of multiple Adam twos is out there working on, uh, on, on his various pieces. Uh, so yeah, I'll just end with that. W w yeah, uh, uh, you, you tell us. When you, when you sent me this question, I kind of felt a little bit depressed. Because you know, it's not like, why is he so clever? Or why is he so funny? Or why is he so good looking? No, no. It's, it's like, why is he so bloody productive? Volume. Like, I want to know just volume. Sheer volume. It's not, like, yeah. it's not, thank it's you, thank set you, aside. Uh, quality concern. No, 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 that's another question. It's a separate question. <laughs> Gladly, I think, I think, I think I've uh, shown you that I, I respect uh, your work. Uh, uh, thank you. Now yeah. it's just about the volume. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of a, mis it's a, it's a little bit of a mystery. Uh, to me too, like I, you know, if you look at my CV, if you look at my profile, um, my life, my I didn't, I, my life wasn't like this before, um, and I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't write with the same fluency. Um, 
I didn't write with the same sense of purpose and energy. I didn't think there was an audience. You know, if you'd asked me 10 years ago whether we'd be in a comedy club in Manhattan, like, (laughs) 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 I know, I mean, but there are some people for whom that is actually a kind of a clear ambition and a clear target, right? Mm. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not my not my trajectory at all. And so something changed. And thinking about it, it is a puzzle. And there's also a kind of terror in the sense it could stop. It could go away again because it's somewhat mysterious as a as a a capacity, if you like. Like I didn't I didn't know I could do this, and I still I still worry. So, what is the explanation? there's certainly something psychological that happened. I mean, something, I mean, and I mean that quite seriously. I mean, I, I, I spent years and years in therapy. And uh, one of the things that it fixed first was my, I can't, you know, I can't say that you know, no, no, n- no one who's really been deep in there will, will ever kind of, you know, come out here saying, well, I'm fixed. But, but, uh, <laughs> but on the writing front, it certainly loosened me up, mm. there's no doubt. And I, and I, um, I moved from, you know, if anyone out there is suffering from writer's block or has difficulty writing, then one of the things I learned to do was to transform that fear into its reverse, its obverse, which was to say, this is something I need to do, something I like doing. How can I get 20 minutes every day to do this? How could I then, and then you get greedy, and then you want half an hour, then you want hours, and then you, then you, you know, you really can't, you start displacing other things to make space for the, the writing that you want to do. Um, Another thing which I learned was to um, was to was was to stop second guessing at some point. Like the hardest book I wrote was um, my third book, Deluge, which took me an age, an eternity, and I don't know how many revisions the chapters in that book went through. And it was it was absolutely agonising, and. Um, Got it done, 2013, and if you look at like my profile of output since then, it, there's something about having finished that book, gotten it done, after which like everything became easier. And after that, I've been able to adopt a kind of stopping rule, which is there's only so many revisions you're going to do. The revi- revisions have a certain process. You know, there's a certain familiar pattern of revision that I go through, and you just have to live with that, but also call a halt to it at some point and just say goodbye to it. And that, those two things, I think, like owning the process is something I actually wanted to do and enjoy and need to do now increasingly every day. And that would be my third point. So the first thing is, as it were, owning the process and acknowledging the fact that it's something that I, I want to do. The th- second thing is finding a point where you stop. And the third thing is really doing it every day. And, and those three things together make for a, for a productive a productive a productive pattern that I didn't have before. Mm. And um and I think just at the sort of the technical level of like um that's what enables me to be to be to write now and to publish. I mean beyond that, you know, I'm I'm it's it's you know everyone balances complicated life choices and I, I'm a I'm an empty nester now. My daughter went off to to boarding school and then to college and it changes and as everyone knows like it entirely changes your if you take all of the time that you're devoted if you're a serious parent if you're devoting that time to a child which I did and, and loved every minute of it well loved most of the minutes and it was very rewarding <laughs> cliche um, but uh, when she went off to boarding school I was completely bereft and I mm. think part of the productivity came you know out of that moment of like needing something to fill the, the space Interesting. Okay. At least I now have an answer from my colleagues. Uh, I can offer them. Uh, no, you're denying there are clones. I, 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 I no, I, I'm okay. useless no, at employing okay. anyone. I, I wish. Okay. I wish I had the knack. Like yeah. you know, Neil Ferguson, have people like that, are famous yeah. for having teams that co-write and write with yeah. them. And I don't see anything wrong with that. I wish I actually was able to kind of manage. Yeah. And I'm just terrible at, at outsourcing. I'm terrible at offloading. Yeah, like that kind I, of like that's like the Renaissance art model of having yeah, a whole, yeah, like, and I think it's a real skill, and like I admire it in people who can do it, and, and and it would be <clears throat> my bet, my life would be easier in many ways, yeah. and um, I can't, I haven't been able to do it. All the better for us. Okay, we're gonna sh- we're gonna shift to the next uh, 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 data point. Uh, um, uh, that data point is twenty million. That's twenty million dollars. That is the total amount of money in the form of two separate $10 million donations that Peter Thiel has given to the campaigns of 
Ohio Senate candidate J.D. Vance and Arizona Senate candidate Blake Masters. That's after donating a couple million dollars to the campaign of Donald Trump in 2016. Yeah, we, we were thinking about how best to address the upcoming midterm elections uh, that we're having here in the U.S. and we decided to take a closer look at Peter Thiel, the German-American billionaire uh, who helped found PayPal and Palantir, the software company. He's more recently become a major donor to the Republican Party and it's not only that he's investing in the party, he's also kind of representing the shift in, in, in the Republican Party's ideological stance towards national conservatism. Uh, that's the kind of intellectual movement for what it's worth that's associated with Trump. Um, so, by way of previewing the new Republican Party that's about to take over Congress by all accounts, uh, we thought we'd take a look at Teals as an economic thinker. So, yeah, the entrepreneur as hero <laughs> seems to loom large in Teal's imagination. I mean, I, I tried delving into some of his writings and that, that theme comes up over and over again. He said, I think in one of his books, yeah, here, uh, most people think capitalism and competition are synonyms. You want to be doing something that no one else is doing. Um, yeah, so maybe this kind of um, entrepreneurship is a standard libertarian impulse, um, but with Patil, there seems to kind of just be this stranger political implications around this. At a class at Stanford, you would apparently talk about how companies are better run than governments because they only have a single decision maker, a dictator, basically. So is that a through line in the history of thinking about entrepreneurs, that they're special, that they're better than the rest of us somehow, that they're deserving of power because of that? Yeah, yeah it's interesting. I've just realized, maybe in the interest of full disclosure, I should say that I've actually met Peter Thiel oh. and his team on Zoom. And I'm now feeling really fortunate that I didn't take any money from them, or rather <laughs> they didn't offer to pay me any. Uh, <laughs> so um, I don't think I would have taken any money from him, but I was really curious to meet them. Hmm. Um, it was back 2020, I think. Uh, yeah, 2020 it was. Must have been, because it was on Zoom. Um, yeah, this idea of... Um, I, uh, nothing really further comes to mind, though. I should also say that it was a rather kind of non-event. I thought, I mean, you know, I'm going into the belly of the beast. I'm meeting, I'm meeting the wizard of whatever it is, the, with the bad wizard. Okay. And like, you know, yeah. something, something interesting is going I don't remember anything interesting happening in that way. So, for the record. Um, yeah, this idea of the entrepreneur is somehow this, this like, magic figure. Um, it's a very, you know, it's difficult to avoid, and it has a, it has a genealogy, right? So it has a, it has a really serious intellectual lineage. I mean, if you, think about, if you think about Max Weber's account of the emergence of capitalism, if you take a non-materialist account of the development of the history of capitalism, so a non-Marxist account, you go to the great German sociologist Max Weber, he had this, he had this, thing, this idea about um, capitalist entrepreneurship as deriving... It's interesting, though. It's not from the fact of very special people being entrepreneurs and doing wonderful things. It's rather more the desperate desire by a certain group of people, namely Calvinists, to demonstrate to themselves that they were special, namely elect by God. And out of the ghastly tension generated by the question of whether you were special or not, it's actually a more honest psychological account, I think, than the simple Teal version. Mm. But out of that agonizing question of who am I and do I amount to anything, in the world, in this case, in a Calvinist vision, you know, am I one of the elect? You then, as it were, translate that, that impossible psychological stress into fiendish levels of activity in the present so as to try and find in your commercial and business success some token of God's grace, some sign of the fact that you are indeed and you do indeed belong in this group. Now, I don't actually think that that psychological model of motivation we were talking, I was talking a minute ago over the difficulties of writing a book. I think one of the big hang-ups about writing a book is the real question is, are you, are you in a sense entitled, right? Are you, are you adequate to the task of being the author of a book? It's an agonizing question to ask yourself. And I think in a, some, that is not a bad way of thinking about certain sorts of very passionate engagement, certain forms of very passionate activity, which may also, in some senses, drive this entrepreneurial energy. Schumpeter talked about it at all, and, and uh, as well, and, and Thiel apparently, I think, draws on Schumpeter. It's, it's sort of unacknowledged, but it's clearly sort of, you know, lurking around the edge of his, of it, edges of his thought. Again, uh, you know, Schumpeter uh, is an early 20th century to mid 20th century Austrian economist who ended up emigra emigrating, finished his career in a rather depressed way in Harvard in the, in the 1940s. 
um, but, but, but created an account of the development of capitalism which was again self-consciously anti-Marxist in that it was a sort of celebratory account of the bourgeois entrepreneurial elite who drove innovation. But neither Weber nor Schumpeter derived any simple conclusions from that for questions of political leadership, right? let alone a simplistic idea that because businesses are run by individuals, generally imagined as individual men, like you know, towering over their enterprises and driving them with the protean force of their personality or whatever, that something followed from that for the political sphere in a straightforward sense. In Weber, the idea of political charisma and the idea of the bourgeois capitalist spirit are not elided. They're not the same thing. They're quite distinct. And Schumpeter, too, did not imagine the bourgeois energy of the entrepreneur being translated into the power of the state. In fact, he was quite worried about that because it would then be subsumed by bureaucracy and that was in fact happening even within big companies. And so this, this idea that somehow the entrepreneurial triumphs of the Californian Silicon Valley tech elite somehow constitutes a reasonable vision of political governance seems really retrograde. I mean, it seems really regressive as a, as a way of thinking about about modern history and, and power. Regressive also is the word that comes to mind when, 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 he talk, when, when he talks about monopolies. He has a very strange idea of monopolies across his writing. He, he, uh, um, he said, I mean, classically in capitalism, monopolies are a bad thing because capitalism is supposed to be about competition, but Thiel writes that capitalism shouldn't be about competition, it should be about the profit motive. That's really what drives capitalism, and monopolies are the only type of business where long-term profits are possible, according to him. So what do you think about kind of transposing the focus of capitalism from competition to profit, and yeah, what's gained and, and lost by, by sort of, by, by thinking of monopolies as a, as, a, as a good thing in this way? Well, th this is a bit of Thiel's sort of um, public persona, which I, in a, in a kind of perverse way, kind of appreciate. Because it, because it cuts through the euphemisms, mm. right? I mean, he has this bizarre theory that America's besetting sin right now is that people are too obsessed with competition, which seems like a very strange way of thinking about the reality of American capitalism in the early 21st century. And his mission is to, as it were, elucidate for everyone that it's actually about profit. Um, Whereas I think the more conventional reading is everyone understands that the talk about you know, competition and private property and shareholding democracy is kind of for the birds and that it's basically a, a nice ideological wrap on a, on, a, on a system which is indeed, exactly as he says, driven by profit because that's what the process of capital accumulation is fundamentally driven by. And as somebody who thinks, you know, who, who, who relishes plain speaking and thinks that liberalism too would be better for a little less hypocrisy, um, I actually find it quite, you know, refreshing that he's willing to say this. You know, if you talk to Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett's theory of investment is to find firms which have what he calls moats, which is another way of describing what Thiel is talking about when he tries to describe as monopolies. Mm. What I find least satisfactory about Thiel is that then he somehow retreats from his own radicalism. When it's this feral assertion of the logic, it's, it's sort of disgraceful, but at least it's honest, right? Mm. And that, but what happens in him is that he slides back into a much more conventional argument that this is actually good for the world, right? And so then he ends up in the position of like Bork and the conservative anti-antitrust people of the 1970s and 80s, which have laid waste to effective American antitrust jurisprudence by arguing essentially a Thielian kind of case that actually big companies that dominate their markets are not terrible for consumers, are not terrible for workers, and may actually be in the best interest of the whole, right? Which, at the limit, in certain particular cases, you can make a case for perhaps only, however, under the auspices of dramatically effective regulation, but instead has become the common sense of American jurisprudence on antitrust, which has essentially gutted America's antitrust system and left America now with a highly monopolized, highly oligopolistic corporate sector in many areas. So the question really is like, like, Peter, what are you actually, mm. you, you're just actually sort of, it's not even, you're saying the emperor has no clothes and literally everyone there knows. <laughs> now, it's not like you're bursting mm. anyone's bubble here. Like, like yeah, we all know. <laughs> um, nice to hear you say it, but like seriously, everyone knows. Um, and, 
and so that's kind of where it sits. And it, of course, I mean, it, it completely fails to answer the question of how we construct even a halfway legitimate social order and political system on the basis of this stark and frankly rather unpalatable reality, which is a question he sort of wants to dodge, right? Because he'd rather talk about seasteading. Yeah. But, but the, the serious argument begins where we stare this problem in the face and say, yeah, that's exactly what this is about. And it generates gigantic wealth and productivity from which a small minority enormously benefit and which drags a large slice of the population along with it, but not in you know, an efficient or effective way. And so then the question is, how do we organize democratic political systems, the rule of law around this? And he just sort of steps away from that question fundamentally. But that is the problem that the rest of us are wrestling with, including, to my mind, serious-minded conservatives. And serious-minded conservatives have been wrestling with this problem since the 19th century. Um. I think we're running a little long, which is typical of us, but I'm going to ask another question about Teal, and then we'll switch to our final uh, 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 data point uh, uh, and then go to the, some, some listener questions. But, <coughs> yeah, I mean, um, I mean, how should we envision the Republican Party? Uh, I mean, if it were to become fully captured by this worldview you're describing of Teal's, um, I mean, what sort of party would it be? I mean, what would you compare it with elsewhere in the world? Are there other sort of... Yeah, how, what, if, if the Republicans were to change in this way and become more teal-like, um, how would you categorize it? Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not personally one, I don't really embrace the sort of category game very, very, very avidly. I'm not one for, we haven't done an episode, well, we sort of did an episode about fascism. We've touched on the populism question. I'm kind of a skeptic as to the utility of those kind of categories. Not that we don't need categories to think with, but trying to find a box into which to hypothetically fit a tealized version of the GOP is, I don't know where that would take us exactly. I mean, my read of the GOP is that they're a political formation in a really deep crisis. And I don't mean that in the sense of, you know, just speaking as a progressive or a leftist, like, but, but more generally, it's clear they have a deep ideological problem, right? Because they're profoundly torn between more conventional understanding of a pro-business party, which is about securing systemically the foundations for the prosperity of big business, not some sort of, not just the sort of fear or hedge fund, occasional superstar investor in California, but the large corporations that still are at the core of the American economy. That's one vision of what conservatism could be about. There's another vision which is value conservative, that profoundly committed to certain very conservative visions of reproductive non-rights, like or the exclusion of reproductive rights. That will be another form of conservatism. Then you could imagine a conservatism that was anchored in a very strong state vision that was essentially about the assertion of American military power at a global level. And then there's something else which is sort of predominant at the current moment, seemingly, which is this rather more catastrophic vision of the world, which sees the world as you know, being driven to hell in a handbasket by various types of liberal politics. And so either you embrace this in an almost nihilist kind of way, or you think you're embarked on a crusade to save America from that. And then finally, there's almost this postmodern, there's a really great review of, of, of a biography of, of, of Teal by Will Davis, the very imaginative British sociologist, who said that when he was reading about Teal, he began to think that there was a passing similarity between Teal and his, uh, his entourage and Andy Warhol and the factory. And that struck me as a really interesting idea. You know, the way that a good way of thinking about Trump's politics is the wrestling, is the wrestling scene. There's a way in which there's a way of thinking about Teal's politics as a kind of, you know, they're both immigrants, Central European immigrants, and they're kind of living out a kind mm. of rather perverse vision of what an American reality could be. <laughs> And, and, uh -huh. and, the, and the, the reality of the GOP right now is they seem to manage to embrace all of these different strands at the same time. And, and, and it's, it's really, it's very difficult to wrap your head around, let alone your arms around it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and I guess then there's a kind of fifth element, which is, well, I've run out of how many in and things we've got at this point. But like, <laughs> there's also the, the vote getting slash vote excluding just, you know, extraordinarily aggressive political machinery which is basically just about owning the libs and beating them over and over and over again 
at every single level in the American political system. And so all of these elements, I think, are at play. And, and to my mind, America is a particularly radical theater for the, for the crisis, the ex explosion of, of mm. conservatism worldwide. Right? I mean, the poly crisis is, is really straining one of the great political traditions of the 19th and 20th century. It's conservatism is, is under massive pressure. Um, and there was ways out of this one could imagine, right? You could found a, you could found a viable politics of the ecology, for instance, out of a value conservatism. Maloney has started mm. moving in this kind of direction, um, but but right now I don't see that coherence, and I don't think that Teal contributes in a useful way to the reconsolidation of the GOP as a as a governing as a governing force beyond this aesthetic level of just <laughs> representing a kind of Americana as Andy Warhol-esque kind yeah. of immigrant. Yeah, interesting. No, no, never thought about it that way. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, we're gonna shift to uh, our, our final data point, that is eight, that is the length in terms of the number of blocks of Wall Street here in New York, here in downtown Manhattan. Um, Obviously, Wall Street is a, 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 a geographic place, but it's also a symbol of America's financial uh, center. It's a, also a symbol of the vitality of New York City specifically. So yeah, we wanted to do something a bit local. We thought we'd look at Wall Street. Uh, Adam, maybe a bit of history first. Uh, the major financial firms these days are basically scattered all over the city, it seems, uh, uh, mostly concentrated in Midtown. So when did Wall Street stop happening on Wall Street exactly? I just, I just got out my notes. One thing you should know about the show, <laughs> it's, a, it's sort of a secret. Is that it's it stays that it's, in this room. It's quite tightly scripted. <laughs> so that normally both Cam and I are reading. <laughs> sort of reading. Like speaking from from notes. Yeah. We discuss the topics. We ahead just, of we're, but like both of us are, have actually got text in front of us. So it's quite strange to be doing this in this more natural kind of conversational mode without like reams of paper and dates and numbers and you know quotes to draw on. Um, but in thinking about Cam's question about you know, how did Wall Street stop being Wall Street and become this almost virtual kind of term, it's, it's really a, a fascinating history because the last, the last big financial player to leave a Wall Street address was Deutsche Bank, okay. which left 60 Wall Street in 2019. And uh, well, announced it was leaving and then contracted um, to take, you know, a property in the, 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 what, what became the, it was in the World Trade Center complex, the new trade, World Trade Center complex. And 60 Wall Street, the building that they had, was a building that went back all the way to Bank of New York. So Hamilton and Bank of New York, the, the location that had been a banking building on that plot all the way back to the 1790s. By the early 20th century, it was shifting hands quite a lot. In the, 90, in the 1980s, it was a car park for a while. Okay. Um, AIG and Bank of New York were then thinking about putting a big building in there. In the end, JP Morgan took it over in 85, and JP Morgan was in there from 85 until 2000. And 2000. So this was this 60 Wall Street was the address for JP Morgan. JP Morgan then decided to merge with Chase and move to Midtown. And Deutsche Bank bought the property from JP Morgan in 2000, just ahead of the 9-11 attack, which destroyed Deutsche Bank's other offices downtown. So that's how Deutsche Bank accelerated into it. But that, that one building seemed mm. to me rather an interesting way of thinking about the succession. So there was an old Wall Street that went all the way back to the Alexander Hamilton 1790s kind of vision of America. But what is it America. now, do you know? Do you know uh, no, it's empty and it's, it's owned by a Singaporean firm and they're, they're cruising well, around trying end. to find, yeah, trying to find tenants. Okay. But, <clears> but the, the, that was the last building fully occupied by a major financial player. All of the other ones, and this is where I got my, it took my notes out, began moving in the, um, already in the 60s and 70s. So basically as, as, uh, as, Wall Street kind of recovered from the Great Depression and the aftermath of World War II when banking was really boring. You know, in the age of Mad Men, Wall Street was not a sexy address, right? Um, and it's really in the 60s, 70s, and 80s that Wall Street really gets sexy again, or rather finance in New York gets sexy again. And they need bigger offices. They need offices that can accommodate IT. 
It's a period from the 70s onwards of massive property development in Midtown, 70s and 80s. And basically, the financial firms of Wall Street, one by one, all of them, Lehman, Bear Stearns, all move away from Wall Street's locations to Midtown or sort of between the 30s and the 50s. So that by the 2000s, you're left with Deutsche Bank, Goldman Sachs, and Merrill Lynch are the last ones actually there. Everyone else has locate, relocated so that, and then fundamentally the New York Stock Exchange as a physical object also mm. loses its anchoring relevance and becomes basically a tourist destination. So if you go to see Wall Street now, you're really, it's like one of those, you know, those studio lots in, in Hollywood. <laughs> like, there's no there there. There's, there's literally nothing left of the mm -hmm. old structure that literally went back to the slave market of Manhattan that was on that site in the early 1700s. Should we stop saying Wall Street? I mean, it sounds like there's not, Wall Street is now just a term that, that has no, yeah, there's no substance left to Wall Street itself, yeah. we should just there's say. No, there's no physical yeah. place. Yeah. Um, much less than in the city of London, which has remained yeah. much more tightly compressed. Um, how about New York as a whole? Is New York still the world's capital of finance? Could, could, should, should we think of New York this way? I mean, what does New York offer in terms of financial services that its competitors don't? I think the short answer to that is any conceivable ranking, and you can you know, metricate this in lots of different ways, but all of the rankings of global financial centers put New York top. Now, 10 years ago, London was really running New York very close, but in the last 10 years, New York has emerged as, as absolutely dominant. Um, and I think there are three things that really, three things that really matter to this. Um, one is the logic of agglomeration effects. We've talked about this a couple of times on the show. It's a sort of Paul krugman -y type story or goes all the way back to Alfred Marshall. You need to be there because everyone else in the business is there too. And so the skill sets, the talent, the labor pool, because labor is highly mobile in this business, entire teams move between banks and trading houses. You need to be in New York because everyone else is in New York. And if you want a deep talent pool, you need to be there. The second reason is the one that Katerina Pistol, my colleague at Columbia, made us aware of in her book on the Code of Capital, which is that there are two legal jurisdictions under which you can do serious money business. And one is English law, not UK, because English law is, you know, English is separate from Scottish, but English law. And the other one is the law of the state of New York. And those are the two major legal codes under which all of the large-scale industrially managed financial engineering goes on. And it's packaged, prepackaged. You have legal teams here who can provide you with it. The court system is set up to arbitrate any disputes that arise. And that's another really fundamental reason for having a foothold in New York and or London. And the third reason is that if you're in New York you're, and you're located in New York and you have a banking license in New York, you are part of the dollar system. And you are under the umbrella, therefore, of the lender of last resort liquidity provision that the Federal Reserve does. Now, the Federal Reserve headquarters, the board, is in Washington, D.C. That was one of the shocking compromises of 1913 when the American Central Bank was set up, was that it was not in New York, not in Wall Street, not under the uh, shadow of J.P. Morgan, but politicized in the nation's capital in D.C. But everyone knows in high finance that when the going gets rough, the entire board and its teams to camp to New York, <laughs> take up literally office space in the New York Fed, and that's where all the action is. That's where the swap lines get done, that's where the QE gets done, that's where the bank rescues are worked out, that's where the pizza's delivered late into the night, that's where the, you know, the legal warrants have to be passed around when you're actually trying to manage the, you know, the meltdown. And so you want to be in New York, because mm. if you're there at that, in, that, in that center, you are under the umbrella. I'll ask one more question here, and then hopefully, yeah, we still have hopefully have time for, for some listener questions. Um, I just wanted to ask, what does the era of now working from home mean for um, the, the sector of financial services, and what does it mean for the city of New York? I mean, if people don't return to the offices of these financial firms, um, yeah, what's going to happen to... The commercial real estate market, for example, what happens to the future of, uh, of New York in general? I think it's a real question, and it's, it's haunting people you know, in, the, in the New York real estate market and the people like um, Blackstone that manage the really big um, commercial real estate um, trusts, the REITs. 
um, because they bundle large slices of business infrastructure in, in traded products, uh, which are going to come under pressure as a result of these, these pressures that you're mentioning. There are struggles going on in almost all of the major banks and consultancies and other financial firms that cluster around you know, this thing we call Wall Street about whether or not people are going to be asked to return to work, because it's quite clear that, in fact, the vast majority of their work can be done offline. Ten years ago, when we were in the heat of the excitement around high-frequency trading and Michael Lewis's book had just come out, one of the answers you would have given as to why people need to stay in New York is that for the super high-frequency trading, you actually need a hardwired proximate connection to the big servers in the, uh, the big exchanges. And the closer you are physically to the server the faster your order goes in. And we're measuring this now in milliseconds. Yeah, milliseconds. Okay. So like, you know, a slow one will get an order in at 10 milliseconds and a really close connection will get you in at five. But, and this is the sort of furtherly disruptive thing, it's now clear that microwave radio is faster than a hardwire <laughs> connection. So what microwave you actually, radio, I'm yeah, so what you actually want microwave is a dish radio. on the on the building, right? And then the microwave is going at 99% of the speed of light. <laughs> So it's really very, very fast okay. indeed. And the people who made big investments in super high quality fiber optic connections are basic, those are all stranded assets now because this technology is faster and the next move beyond that apparently is laser. Mm. Um, and so then all you really need Obviously. is a line of sight. Laser. You need a direct, a series of direct <laughs> lines of sight that couple these things together. And that would allow dislocation. So all of the data centers for the New York Stock Exchange, for NASDAQ, none of them are in Manhattan, they're all in New Jersey. Okay. And that, that is where the big hubs are. And then there are more hubs in the Midwest, and those are connected by, by microwave radio relay. And those are the connections that, that really, really matter and dominate this. But if you look at uh, New York, to just conclude on an upbeat note. Okay, because I was going to say, it sounds like you're saying New York is screwed. No, no, the thing, <laughs> about, the thing about this city is that people still nevertheless will come to work because mm. it's an attractive and pleasant place, or an interesting place at least, to go to work. <laughs> and, and, um, interesting is one way No, to because it's, it's, really, it's really on, telling in the so data. I've been on the subway so, in a while. so if you look at the global data, because we're in America, right, people have gone back less than they have in Europe and Asia. But amongst American big cities, New York is the city which has seen the biggest return to work. So if you compare New York to its major commercial financial rivals, which are LA, Houston for oil, and Chicago, the return rate in New York is considerably higher. And that's true also for many of the smaller rivals. So there is just stuff to do here, right? Which means that at least three or four days of the, work, day of the week, it's not unattractive to go into the office. And, to, and I think that kind of hybrid model, but the effect of this is definitely shrinking. So when Deutsche Bank quit its you know, Wall Street 60, 60 Wall Street office and moved into its new place, it downsized by 30 to 40%. So less office space is, is absolutely is necessary. Uh, we will conclude our data point section here, but uh, I wonder, do we have a microphone to go around if there are any questions from the audience? Um, and we did really well. I mean, we, like, we started at 10 past. We did three segments in just over an hour. That's pretty good for us. That's like That's way better than us. we do. Uh, <laughs> That's pretty good for us. That is. Uh, um, yeah. We You've got a question at the front here, on yeah. the one at the back there. Um, yeah, why don't we start right here? Do you have a, um, oh, there we go. Perfect. Hi. Uh, I just had a question. We talked a little bit about monopolies, and I was curious if um, you had any distinctions or frameworks that you would sort of make for monopolies in information or communication technologies. I'm sort of thinking of Tim Wu's Master Switch book, um, the principal argument being that these technologies influence how we think about ourselves. And I'm curious if in this new era, in this poly crisis, how monopolies in that particular industry, I'm thinking of Google and Facebook particularly, um, factor into this, uh, this notion of a poly crisis. That, that's, um, that's super interesting, yeah. Um, I mean, especially if you think of the, if you, if, you, if you define crisis in terms of identity crisis fundamentally, right, then this question of meaning and comprehension, which is clearly mediated by the, the, the centuries-old descendants of print capitalism, which, you know, which set this whole beast going in the West from the, from the early modern period onwards. 
are really in the crosshairs. And um, you know, the, presumably the, the, the logic of this is that um, there are dangers both in monopoly and in the reverse, which will be a kind of balkanized space in which everyone can just break out into their separate zone for comprehending the world. That can obviously also happen within the space of uh, you know, a single platform provider. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't, I mean, I'd I thank you for asking it in the way that you did. In other words, do I have thoughts about it? I think uh, the, the, the question is, so I, I think um, there's, you know, there's a meta answer which would say that Tim Wu is a blessing to the world and the fact that the Biden administration, you know, is hiring people like him and forcing them to the center of the debate means that we are at least taking a step to the level that we need to be at, which is that this is the frontier of a new kind of politics and it needs to be continuously policed, right? I think that's the first meta observation, right? So that we have entered that zone and that we now essentially have three regimes at the global level that are contending and offering, so the European, the American, and the Chinese regime are the three that are on offer, essentially. Um, that marks a kind of transition in our history. It's difficult on this kind of issue, um, you know, not to speak from one's own, um, I mean, I, gr I grew up in public broadcasting systems in Europe, and um, it's very difficult, I think, for somebody who has grown up in a system like that, and I know this is not a exception shared by many American friends and colleagues, but it's difficult for me not to think of public broadcasting, in other words, highly regulated, explicitly politicized, mechanisms for patrolling this sort of space as an essential anchor. Now, doing the public radio, public TV moves that the Europeans made and the Americans didn't make in the critical phase in the aftermath of World War I and World War II was hugely contentious. It was obviously open to various types of manipulation. It is in no way a magic bullet type answer for this is how things are gonna go well for very obvious reasons. But in the same sort of meta sense that it gives you leverage, it gives you additional players, it gives you diversity in the regulatory debate, it seems to me on democratic grounds one would favor it. The fundamental question, of course, is whether it's not just absurdly behind the pace and behind the curve of the current generation of technology. And my like feverishly busy, brilliant, they're not even graduate students, but like undergraduate, um, dynamos that I, you know, I'm fortunate to have around me in, in, in Colombia, tell me that all of the serious debate, not perhaps down the teal palantir end, but at the other end of the spectrum in Silicon Valley right now, is in fact over the question of how to police AI um, as an independent um, force, you know, in this in this space, because the the big fear is that. The machines cut loose, basically, become self-learning, self-teaching, so rapidly outpace us with the chess-playing machines as, as you know, you know, uh, uh, as as the sort of terrifying example of how quickly this could go. If they can play games with themselves at the pace they can play games with themselves, they learn very, very fast. And the fear is that that could be a model of of where of where we end up. And that I don't think anyone, I mean, that my sense of the drama of that is that we don't have any patented, off-the-shelf, obvious answers to those, to those questions. The, the journalist colleagues, I mean, another way I experience this is that journalist colleagues I have, notably those who are exposed to the pressures, say, of Chinese censorship, their two fears are, like, the, the best, the most brilliant Chinese journalists and kind of media people I know have two fears. One is, one is that they will be censored out of existence by the regime and end up in jail or just destroyed. And the other one is that they will be replaced by AI. <laughs> right? And their, their understanding of, of, of the fragility of their position is that they navigate a line between those two, those two threats. And, and to me, like, both are, you know, as a kind mm. of a liberal, you really at that realize, check your liberal privilege. Like at that point you realize, uh, you know, this, is, this exceeds the bounds of my late 20th century, almost comprehension. <laughs> um, but I do, I have found the, you know, I have found that could you re be replaced by AI? It's quite, quite a bracing one. 
I mean, it's, it's, worth, it's worth applying to ones. You know, when you ask me about my productivity, this is mm. part of like what terrifies me. It's yep. like, oh God. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Out of anyway. everyone in this room, I feel like you'd you'd be the you'd be the last one to be replaced by the AI. I don't know. I don't know. But um, um, uh, we'll see. I think this is I mean, it's really it's a fascinating like the dilemma, right? This choice between a a, 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 a truly comprehensive bid for old style censorship driven political control, which, li I mean, the grandeur of what the Xi Jinping regime is doing in this space, you know, just making laughing stock out of Bill Clinton. Making a laughing stock out. I was just listening to the, the you know the Economist podcast episode on this th today at lunch, and they have that they have Bill Clinton going, oh, censor to the internet, like, you know, go ahead, that won't work, will it? <laughs> and it's like you could have that play on infinite repeat, um, and it would turn your stomach every time you heard it. I think we can squeeze in one more question. Um, oh yes, we have right. Hi. Um, Adam, you used the phrase late capitalism in passing, and I think you were using it derisively, but I wondered, do you, does it mean anything? Because one hears it bandied about a lot. Is it, do you think there is such a thing, or is it just a phrase that people use to talk about you know, greed or excess or, or you know, just all this uh, whilst sounding a little bit more clever? Oh, oh no, so, so uh, I, mean, it, it may, I mean, it may of course be greed and, and all of this, but but that I would take as a kind of eternal thing, right? I mean, the, the kind of greed critique is not the novelty. So the late capitalism idea, um, you know, goes, it's kind of fascinating because um, we didn't really start talking about capitalism. Capitalism is not a phrase that Karl Marx uses, right? Um, he talks about capital and capital, capitalist mode of production, but capitalism is a kind of neologism of the late 19th century. At least that's my first cut. I haven't read Mike Sonnich's book yet, which I'm gonna, uh, uh, but, um, but that's, that's kind of when it really enters widespread debate. So Max Weber, Werner Sonnbach, Joseph Schumpeter are the first, they're the kind of, because we, we compress everything, right? Because the capitalist, the, the Communist Manifesto was written in 1848. So by the end of the 19th century, it's as far away as the 1970s is to us now. So it's some very old social theory shit by that point. Like people really needed to innovate and come up with new models. And by the late 19th century, what they were talking about was this thing, capitalism, which had consolidated, had not blown up in the way in which the mid-century theorists, the mid-19th century theorists expected, and was actually kind of a going concern. And the big concern of Weber was it was going to become too bureaucratic. Schumpeter's concern was going to become too bureaucratic. The antidote to that was, believe it or not, technology, namely the second industrial revolution, uh, uh, you know, uh, electrical engineering, modern chemistry, the, the motor car, airplanes, and so on, right? And late capitalism is a term of art coined to, to capture that moment, to capture this sense that capitalism had a history. It wasn't just a passing thing. It wasn't just something that came into existence in the mid-19th century and immediately exploded. It actually had kind of a long history potentially, and the phase that the contemporaries thought they'd entered in the late 19th, early 20th century was what they called late capitalism. And it was then repeatedly renovated and updated, and so you'll find Ernest Mandel, um, the great theorist in the Trotskyist tradition, who's widely cited by the New Left Review folks, they also employ a late capitalism idea. So I was not using it derisively, sorry, I've been speaking too much German. It's like deris, der, as, as a form of derision, I was using it as a shorthand for my friends in New Left Review who, who would go to that, right? If they, if they, because it, it, it tells you in capitalism, it tells you that capitalism has a history, but it also presumably indicates that capitalism has an ending because it's late, right? We're not, we're, we're in the final stage, things have become old. And um, it's a shorthand for, for instance, um, financialization is quite widely seen by certain critical traditions on the left as a symptom of a late capitalist stage. When you run out of other mechanisms for generating profit and accumulation, you go there. And, and that, I don't find it's a terribly helpful way of thinking about a world which has spawned you know, what Teal and what you were invoking or has created the incredible explosion of Chinese growth. So. You know, um, I'm not sure. I think late may be an experience of like you know old Europeans, um, but but is not very well described the state of the overall system um, at a global level at this point. 
Unfortunately, we are in the late stage of this event, uh, and we do have an ending, and it is now. So, uh, yes, uh, uh, this was the first Ones and Twos live event, and it was a lot of fun. I hope it's not the last, but uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you to Adam. Thank you to the FP crew that is here for helping organize this. And um, yeah, see you next time, I suppose. And yeah, let's uh, have a drink. Hey.